All right, hello everyone, and now welcome to episode number 25 of Verdicts of the Ancient Kings, uh, aptly titled Looking for Brides. We'll see what's going to be happen happening here as we have just finished a cosmic CCS Cosmic Crown Showdown. Uh, also, I believe we had a five shards diamond cup, so a lot of heavy, heavy constructed as the meta really shifted on a lot of players who weren't expecting it. We'll be going over our puzzles, looking at some PVE as well. And well, alongside me, of course, we have Nico. Nico, how are you doing? Good, good. Um, I think it was fun to hear about all the new decks that came out during the constructed scene. So hopefully we get a small chance to talk about that a little bit today. Yeah, we'll we'll probably just scratch the service. We haven't really looked at them in depth. I haven't been able to play a lot of the decks, even though I I have tried to craft some of those. But let's go ahead and jump straight into the puzzle for or from last week, as I'm sure the winners want to know if they won and what they will be winning. I still haven't decided yet. I think last week I ended up giving out one of every single of the mercenaries, the the Gax, the Portensio, and the Bros I book. Um, I, I may end up giving four Cloud Queens with equipment. We'll, we'll figure it out, and and everyone or everyone else got some convocation packs. So, Nico, take it away with last week's puzzle. Okay. Um, so last week we um, I came to, at you with a puzzle that basically um, asked you to figure out how to win um, on your turn or yeah on your turn. So you had eight resources. You had two diamond threshold, two blood threshold, and you had one artifact in play. It's your first main phase. Your opponent has a board heavy with artifacts and two war machinists, um, and they have 20 health. Um, there's only, you're only allowed to use PvP cards, and your champions and charges do not apply. Your deck does not apply, and your crypt is empty. So basically, win with the two cards that are in your hand and the artifact that's in play. Um, set six cards are allowed and extinction is not allowed. So um, the trick here was basically, yeah, we gave a lot of hints away, like the artifacts in play, we even mentioned on our last podcast that internal invoker could be a potential card to, to use, which was actually part of the intended puzzle. You'll see my my the, apologies uh, there, I did not know. I, I was just like, wait, wait, wait. No, it's There's cool. a really good p card that says you can play any card for free. Could that be one of the two? Well, one of the feedbacks we got on our last podcast too, which was a nice comment to see, is that a lot of people like to figure out um, scenarios based on cards they have in their hand. So like, you know, did they make the right line? Did they, did they do the right play in the mm -hmm. right order? And maybe that's what we should move towards in our puzzles because it's really, it's coming to that in, in the meta now where there's so many different ways to play and build a deck that, it really comes down to whether or not you're sequencing your your play correctly. Mm. So we'll try to do more of those types of puzzles in the future. Um, but anyway, yeah, so so this is a puzzle here. Internal Invoker allows you to play your first card for free. So we'll play a Waltz, for, Waltz of the Damned for free, and then we gain control of all their troops. Now, I think when you gain control of a troop, I don't think it actually redeploys. So that's not, I don't believe that's enough to deal damage based on the War Machinist coming into play with all the artifacts. But um, but then then we play Merim after we sacrifice all those troops we gain control of, and um, Merim will at the end of our turn put them all back into play, and with the War Machinist um, you'll see that um, you'll end up doing quite a bit of damage. I believe even the Internal Invoker will also trigger off of it, and then you can use your Flax Scrappers sacrifice. Um, artifacts in play and then deal the last um, four points of damage to the opponent. I think it comes to 22 damage total. So um, three people um, actually sent me an email, only three. So not too many people taking advantage of these puzzles and prizes. Um, and all three of them get to win a prize. So congratulations, Slayer Stronghold, you win. x Betty and Syru, all, all winners. All right, so yeah, I'll, I'll be sending out those prizes later this week. It's sometimes I'm just lazy. Um, you, you wouldn't believe how painful it is to scratch off that many codes and then try and type it out, trying to distinguish between zeros, I's, O's, and ones, and L's. It is, it is very, very maddening, but I will be sending those out. Um, thank you for everyone who did. Um, go ahead and send 
um, who went ahead and sent in your solutions and well hopefully we'll have another we will have another puzzle for you guys and hopefully um, you guys will find this one a, a little bit easier or a little bit more challenging a, at least more worth your while to go ahead and try and enter as we move right along to some pve fun with mobilize um, here's a deck that really really centers around mobilize it is a diamond sapphire deck um, as of course as always, of course, your expert in all things PVE, Nico, did build this deck. And what was your inspira What was your heroic inspiration behind this particular deck? Since you did throw in a heroic inspiration in there. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I've been working. Uh, I've been putting a lot of hours into a mercenary guide I'm working on for Hex Primal, um, and I'm just I'm not getting to the end because I keep having to build decks and port them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just taking me a lot of time and i noticed that you know with all the new um pve campaign mercenaries that came out with set six that i had a little bit of um, back work to do so i went back and built um, a few decks for some of those new mercenaries and hadrian corporal hadrian happens to be one of the most affordable ones he's a triple white star role for um scars of war chests so he's really easy to get and um he has an interesting deck um, building challenge where you have to include at least 10 mobilized troops so um they have to be troops and do they a have lot to be different, different names or just the same name um they can be the same name so right. you'll see on on this deck list here i only have exactly 10 mobilized troops in this deck uh four of them are the oh man I, it's hard for me is it cloud bounders or something mm -hmm. Yeah, the Cloud uh, Bounder, and four, four of them are the Typhoon the Sly team. Shapers. You have one yeah. Cosmic Flash Paw and then one one Dawn yeah. Mesa Duo. And the reason I have one of each of those is I only own one of each, but I happen to own four of the Typhoon guys. But it, the deck actually works surprisingly well with these specific quantities. Um, you'll see I'm also playing some other cards that either exhaust or ready my troops. Mm -hmm. So I have like Blind Side that... Um, the equipment for that gives it a permanent plus three plus three dil diligence trigger. Oh, wow. So that's really nice. And then um, I also have in the llama herder that um, creates llamas and can also exhaust my troops. But the really cool thing about this deck, just kind of glazing over everything else in here, is the synergy with uh, Protectorate Defender and his glove equipment. So um, the... The Typhoon, the Typhoon uh, Sky Shaper guy will allow me to bounce a troop back into my hand. So I can just bounce that Protectorate Defender back into my hand, replay it, draw another card. And if I happen to have a Cobblestone, I can also deal two damage to an opposing troop. And then that Protectorate Defender also has the Ardent Gem in him, and all of my troops in the deck are Ardent. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm quickly just crushing the board with uh, fast troops that enter play. Uh, ardent recruiter reducing the cost of things and then mobilize also reducing the cost of things um so it's just a really fun deck and i of course i have four outposts to help me uh, make sure my troops are exhausted so um yeah it's it's fun to play check it out it's not super expensive to build you can um, kind of customize it your own way and put in mobilized troops you have if you don't have all of these yeah, but the I Mystic Naturalist agree. is probably a good... No, no, Mobilize, not Diligence. What are some other Mobilized troops that you didn't um, include? There is the four-cost Quick Troop. That's Coyote Diamond mm -hmm. um, with Mobilize. He's pretty good. Um, I think he has equipment, too. And the Cloud Bounders equipment's cool. It says, um, for every exhausted troop in play, when this comes into play, those troops get flight permanently. Oh, yeah, so it's really not. I think it's like boots equipment or something. So um, super cool equipment. Pretty soon you have a llama herder that's flying, and uh, yeah, it's a little ridiculous. Also, protector and defender with the ardent gem that's flying is also ridiculous. And then uh, we also have heroic inspiration with the weapon equipment that gives us plus eight, plus eight, and life steal on defense. So um, talk talk about you know staying alive. This deck can stay alive as well.
Very strong. So any of, any of you guys out there who are looking to experiment with new decks in PvE, I would definitely recommend this deck. It looks like it's a lot of fun and just really use a lot, um, utilizing those new keywords and mobilize, being able to drop your hand and then using Consult the Talon to replenish that if necessary. Um, moving along, um, both Nico and I are, I would say, more limited players than constructed players. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that we're, we're definitely limited players and and we don't claim to be very, very great at it, but we do get in a lot of reps. And what we wanted to do was showcase um, a draft and showcase a little bit of the thought behind it. And really what you're trying to do whenever you're drafting a deck or whenever you're trying to make a limited deck, unless you get some outrageous, outrageous bombs, you really want to make a deck that is stronger than the sum of its parts. And that's really what we're looking to do in in limited. Whether or not you have that that eye to see that the deck that you are building is greater than the sum of its parts. And I would say every pool out there, you can usually get at least three wins, if not four and five, as as long as you don't fall into always what you know. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. I mean, this is a draft deck, not an Evo deck, but mm -hmm. um yeah, I would say four wins out of five in almost any EVO pool is fair, fairly easily achievable. Uh, there are some cases where you're just going to get crushed by somebody that gets a lot luckier than you. But mm -hmm. um, if you're a decent player and a decent deck builder, you should be able to do that pretty consistently. All right, so looking at, looking at this deck, um, tell us about your first picks and how you ended up going in this specific direction. It looks like you kind of went Ruby, Ruby blood, obviously with some sacrifice for those dreadlings. And then you have the ruth ruthless cutthroats. You also have the, the blood sworn and the infiltrators to actually trigger your, your sacrifices as well. So how did this all come about? Yeah. So interesting question. I should have showed you my entire reserve pool, but I actually started with a, uh, stifling sting or something yeah, that rare card that's ruby sapphire mm -hmm. that um you deal th three damage to champion or troop if you deal damage to champion interrupt any three cost card mm -hmm. um so that was my first pick so i tried to start going sapphire but it, it seemed like after my 12th pick or so that i was being cut off mm -hmm. so I, I just stopped that strategy dead in its tracks started picking up a few blood cards and um I I kind of just started morphing my strategy. Like, I, I know I really like the card Blitz, and I think Blitz is su super strong. It's crushed me a few times. Mm -hmm. So every time I saw Blitz, I just grabbed it. And then I, I was getting some decent Ruby removal, too. So it just it was a very strong Ruby deck. And then in the second pack, I picked up a Lasgar's Blood a Letter. And I'm like, well, you know what? I think maybe Blood is going to be my secondary color. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I was grabbing gazes to cut them from the pool because I really hate playing against gaze. Mm -hmm. so you can see, I have those three gazes on my sideboard. And um, I, I just started to pick up cards that I, I thought were pretty high value. Like um, the Thorn Weaver was a tough pick. Yeah, I have one Thorn Weaver in there. I think I was competing with um, something else that was really strong in Sapphire. And then that was about around the time where I'm like, I guess I'm just really committing to. Ruby primarily, and then um, Blood secondary. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other thing I was trying to do as well is be mindful of the amount of Ardent Troops I had in my deck because I wanted to make sure that I was able to trigger my Lava Shaper that I got mm -hmm. um, in my third and last pack when it was set five. So I, I just started making sure I, I grabbed a few more um, of the Ardent Troops as well. Like I, I did get an Ashwood Firebrand. and um, The Blackfire Sorcerer. Yeah, the Blackfire Sorcerer. So I, I tried to mix it up pretty good, but I, I slowly moved a little further away from the Dreadling mechanic, mm -hmm. even though I wanted to have those Scrown Triggers and Dreadling Generation for a few of the cards on my list. Like, it was really hard for me to cut the Galliant. Um, I cut one of the Galliant Duelists, you can see in the right reserve. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did that mainly so that I can squeeze in a Koru Infiltrator, just because I thought it was more utility. Um but it's something I could change after sideboard if it's not working out well. So mm -hmm. this is a draft deck I haven't actually played yet, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of my thoughts. And, and also, I, I think that the Rootless Cutthroat, I 
I started going more dreadling themed when I got that, knowing that it could get out of hand if I can get him pretty big. Hold on a second. What was that? All right. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I got distracted yeah, for a second. No, no problem. So yeah, I also was able to pick up a Lasgar's Bloodsworn and a Dread Factory in the very last pack. Yeah, and that, uh, that Dread Factory is an absolute amazing pickup now, now that there's only one Hero Fall pack. So yeah, being, being able to get that, um, just one, is, is amazing at this point. And I picked it super early too, and it was in this in a pack that also had the um, the Ruby Outpost as well. So it was a tough choice, but I, I figured that even if I didn't play it, I don't want someone else to get it because if I have to face them, it it could end up, um, you know, beating me in in that scenario. So it was kind of a defensive pick, but also uh, it worked for my deck as well. Yeah, well, and I know. You any game where you can get a turn one Dread Factory, turn three Mind Rack Sorcerer, you're pretty much going to be in the clear in that particular game, short of any very, very heavy fancy removal at that point. Yeah, and, and everything I, I can do to also make more value out of that Lasgar's Blood Letter, I thought would be nice as well, just because, you know, I can sacrifice anything I want and start dealing damage to troops or champions. Definitely. So, like, I look at this, I, I see a definite two win. And the three win seems to be a little bit of a of the luck where sometimes your opponent is just going to get some amazing, amazing cards on you, and there's not much you can really do. But um, definitely a solid two win deck. I do like how you're mindful of um, of a, of a major and a secondary color. A lot of the times, I see new players try to draft, and and they'll split it a little bit too close to fifty fifty, where they have an average threshold of almost 1.5 for each. And that, that's generally where I start seeing players get into a little bit of shard issues and um, just because they don't get their second threshold on both both of those colors. So sometimes um, that can be a little bit, little bit of a setback as well. I think Exporsion is the only card that has double, double blood, correct? Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the other reasons why I can't really play Blight Reaper, even though Blight Reaper would be great. Mm -hmm. This is triple blood threshold, just a little too much to commit to. But yeah, I mean, I try to be mindful of that every time I draft. I, I have, I, I totally agree with you. I think if anything, I'd be happy with the two, two wins, uh, two round wins for this draft. Um, I've lost to a lot of people drafting Mono Ruby and, you know, Sapphire uh, Flight Evasion might blow me out as well. So mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure I have the removal I need or the, um, the aggression I need to beat those types of decks. Yeah, I, I think the two main archetypes that um, I see a lot in Limited and draft not so much just because you can't necessarily get all the cards is that Diamond Sapphire evasion with flight that we're talking about and also the the blood sapphire where it's just dreadlings with tactician and the plus one plus one on all of your troops being able to generate six dreadlings and swing for almost 18 in just dreadlings on a single turn that can become very problematic for a, a lot of players who aren't um, quite ready and don't realize what the deck can do and it almost surprises a lot of players out, out of the blue yeah, the, the Theraz um, theme decks just seem to really crush people that aren't ready for it. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I don't think I have the removal I need to deal with that per se, but I do have some nice early drops and um, counter pressure that might be able to steal it back on the, the backswing. Yeah. All right, so um, going on, um, I just wanted to share a couple of stories from Limited just because... Um, these limit like whenever you play limited you, you win some games you lose some games but when you lose a game in in such a catastrophic fashion that you know that there's nothing that you can do about you just kind of laugh and and you and you move on and and i had two of those games this past weekend and it all stemmed from from the ashes um, from the ashes is a legendary six cost basic action double diamond double blood threshold you can see it right here it says destroy all troops choose a troop in an opposing crypt and put it into play under your control now the first story that i had and i and i think i told nico about this i had basically set up to get i had pesky pippet in my opening hand I had a wild valor or a, a, a wild favor and two additional troops in my opening hand. And I wanted to get the scrounge six 
I, I had everything absolutely set up, got the pesky pivot under the table with the scrounge six, only to see a from the ashes hit the board, take out the giant scroll that was on my side, and then he takes the pesky pivot, and he has a 3-3 and a 10-10, or a 7-7 coming at me every turn. What do you yeah, do in those situations? Brutal. <laughs> so brutal. Yeah, you did tell me about that. And and it's it's just those stories where like uh, you can play everything right, you can you can plan everything absolutely right, and you're just gonna get absolutely blindsided. And the same thing happened again to me today with From the Ashes, where I I got my Soul Speaker Revenant out with a major the sacrifice gem. And I had attacked with him. He was going to start ready and start pulling all of all of my troops from the crypt. And my opponent plays from the ashes, takes my soul speaker, and then he just starts to recursion his entire crypt and gets every single troop into play. And at, at those points, you, you just kind of got to laugh and just go, you know what? Like, there's no point in flipping the table. And, and, and you just move on. And it's how you play the game after those bad beats that really, really uh, marks whether or not you're going to be a good player, if you can keep your nerves under control. Yeah, that's very true. It is um, it is more about like just knowing how to roll with the punches. Um, I think a lot of people that play Hex um, that might be maybe newer to T TCGs don't necessarily understand that, um, you know, you're, you're not always gonna, going to feel like your game was all skill-based because mm -hmm. luck is a huge element. So you just have to be okay with that because it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I know that there's there's probably a lot of people that aren't okay with that. Yeah. Well, if you're not okay with luck in your game, go play chess. Go play, go play games like that where all of the information is available to you. But what's nice about TCGs and what, what gets lost sometimes is rolling the dice, taking the chance, knowing that you're trying you're you're really just trying to reach for something and if it happens to roll your way, then you win otherwise you lose. And that's something that um we'll I'll probably talk about a little bit before we get into the next puzzle um and that I have at the end of the show, but anything else any stories from your neck of the woods that you want to share about bad beats? Yeah, I mean I have similar from the ashes stories. Uh Yasi even told me about his from the ashes before our match, and I still walked right into it, and he just crushed me. Um, I don't know what else I would say. Um, I have been blown out, like I said, a blitz. I, I value that highly. That card's blown me out quite a few times as mm -hmm. well. Um, mobilized blitz speed troops, like that six cost orc, is really good. And then um, crazy, crazy uh, grandfather elk plays on like surging wildfires with um, additional pump. Yeah. Also. The, yeah, like sur yeah, surging wildfire with blitz, with the pump. All yeah. of a sudden, your your 1-4, your 2-4, your 3-4 turns into a 10-10 a or a 10-14 with crush, and you're already going to do 10 to the face, and now you have to, like, chump block it with four things to try and not die that turn. Yeah, but all in all, I, I really like the limited format because you're not... You're not typically losing to those types of things on turn four, like a Mama Yeti. Mm -hmm. um, the games are definitely going longer, which makes them more enjoyable. Yeah, and there seems to be more valuable decisions where during the early early portions of the game, you you wonder to yourself, okay, do I what? Like it, the question could be, do I play a Moon Call Ceremony turn one, or do I play a Boisterous Ballad turn one? And th those, that's an actual valid question. Like, what what are you gonna do? And it's gonna set up the tempo for the rest of the game. Like, do yeah. you hope for the Hero of Legend on turn two, or do you hope for the Llama Herder on with speed on turn two? And 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 the board state, are you on the play? Are you on the draw? And those small decisions that you make early in the game now seem to have more impact later on, which is which is proper escalation in a TCG. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. All right, so I'm um, moving right along. Um, I had a quick, quick chance to look at some of the constructed decks that uh, took top eight in the Diamond Cup and also took top eight in the Cosmic Crown Showdown. And 
blood was very, very heavily represented, especially um, these three particular cards. Um, Rob Paw Gang was a card that seemed to be splashed into every single um, every single deck that ran blood, Zorath's Rectory and Bride of the Dam. Bride of the Dam, you saw more play if it was mono blood, and Zorath's Rectory, you saw more play if it was blood wild with Kaguli Kagulichu and yes. being able to just start ramping like mad. Those dreadlings, one one dreadlings with the socketable wild gem. When they attack, you gain a permanent resource. Was absolutely, absolutely horrific as players then started playing horrors of war and completely decimating their opponent's resources while they were still sitting on say 10 resources or 12 resources later on in the game yeah it was interesting to see those deck lists i i never would have thought of that like uh, zora Rectory was a card i've looked at briefly and like oh that's cool it has a major socket and like make dreadlings but i i don't think i immediately thought oh i can make dreadlings that give me permanent resources every time I make them and then just keep making more and more dreadlings. Like, that's just crazy synergy with that particular card mm -hmm. that makes it a must-remove constant. Like, probably the probably the strongest constant in the game um, for what it does, at least with this particular gem uh, rotation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just crazy to see that deck. And Rapa Gang, obviously, with dreadlings, being able to just keep getting it from your crypt and putting it back into your hand and replaying it is a great way to get around a uh, removal like Hero Fall that might take all of your copies of it out of the game, but you still can keep getting that one back and replaying it. And then if you give it Flight and Life Train, eventually you're going to be able to start swinging back with it or making value blocks that will start to get your health back up. Yeah. And Bride of the Dam, I, I saw a lot of interesting plays that I was watching a little bit of Pentachill's shout casting and it was really cool to see people wait until like turn six and and play it and then immediately her up all troop and, and put it into play under their control it's just the value bright of the dam offered in um constructed control right now is i, I think kind of unparalleled mm -hmm. i think everything's okay behind me sorry <laughs> No worries. Yeah, so it, it just blood is so much better now. Um, also with other control cards, it has like the um, uh, gaze, wither gaze, and mm -hmm. uh, so the new um, negative four, negative four um, strangle. Yeah, strangle. So the removal has gotten better. It has more of the quick removal than some of the other uh, thresholds. So it's just, it's a very strong monocolor right now. Um, and you can you can pair it with a lot of different things um, if you want to splash a second color. Yeah. Yeah, so just be on the lookout of the out for the blood cards. I think a lot of players were sitting on a lot of their decks, not playing them on the constructed ladders until they until they really wanted to showcase um, all of their deck building prowess uh, at the major tournaments this past weekend so really really nice to see the meta shaking up and cards going every which way and seeing new decks um quick thing to note zorat's rectory this particular card and um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with gem rotation just because gem rotations do rotate with odd numbers and set rotations rotate out with even numbers so We'll see what happens when the next when the next set does come around. Will Zoras Rectory have a sudden fall? Uh, will will there still be the one one permanent resource gem? Only time will tell us. Anyways, moving on to the next puzzle and and one of the reasons why I enjoy designing these particular puzzles is is because it helps train how I'm supposed to be thinking when I play TCGs. When I first was playing Hex and first playing some of the other TCGs out there, I, I got into an, what I would call the incorrect mindset, where as opposed to trying to win the game, sometimes I would try to keep the game close, where, oh, you know, the, the final score on the life was five to zero, and, and I lost. Well. At the end, it doesn't matter if you're five to zero versus seventeen to zero. 
you st- you still lost that that game, and it would actually be better if I had played a game where I I had a chance to win. And played my cards a certain way, perhaps not necessarily as efficient in terms of maintaining maintaining my life, but keep but having seventeen to zero and still having a a thirty percent chance of winning as opposed to a five to zero game where I didn't have any chance at all. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I mean, it, knowing knowing how to correctly sequence your plays and just um, think through different scenarios. Well, we'll give you a leg up against your opponents, and and that's really huge in a card game that is all about you know just winning and uh, you know making sure that you're making the most use of the cards in your hand that you can. Yeah. So with this particular um, puzzle today, I'm gonna basically you see what's happening on oh, here. Your opponent has 17 life. You have three out of four resources two blood, two sapphire threshold, and it's the end of your opponent's turn. You have one card in hand, and what you're really trying to do is you're really trying to play to your outs. You only have one card in hand, your opponent's at 17. Um, All of their troops just assume that they're exhausted, and when they ready next turn, they're going to overwhelm you. So you need to win the next turn. What do you do? You purposely didn't block with the Skittering Cultivator, afraid that they might have some sort of removal, put lethal on it, now it's your turn to pull this victory. What's the one card in your hand? And I believe you only need two cards in your deck to win, and there's no cards in your crypt. So um, once again, go ahead and send submissions to Nico Sharp. Um, anything that you want to add on this particular puzzle? Uh, just be, pay a lot of attention to set six I and mean, there, there's a lot of great cards in set six that will probably help you figure this one out yeah like i could actually say um assume that you're playing you're playing limited you're 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 playing six six five so you only need set six and set five cards in order to solve this puzzle yep all right well um that's all i have um for today nico do you have anything else no, that's, uh, I think we got packed a lot in. All right. Well, from all of us here at Cornerstone and everyone who plays Hex, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed it. See you next time.